Welcome to Miracle Living Today. Michael Pruitt was almost killed after getting into a motorcycle accident. Within minutes of hitting the pavement, Michael's family and friends began praying. And here's how it saved his life. I couldn't swerve one way or the other. I couldn't get out of the way. And the only thing that I could do was drop the motorcycle. Michael Pruitt was a struggling real estate agent in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. He was newly married to Dawn, but overwhelmed with family issues and mixed up priorities. My daughters and I were just it was pretty tense in our house. Uh, we weren't getting along very well. I was trying to control my own life. I was trying to control the outcomes. The things that gave me self-confidence um, were material things, money, success, uh, getting a sale, things like that. In the summer of 2012, he was on his way home from showing a house when a truck pulled out in front of Michael's motorcycle. Michael wasn't wearing a helmet. We had a head-on collision. I was knocked unconscious. I ended up underneath the truck and was drugged uh, for quite a while. Members of the fire department witnessed the accident from a nearby restaurant and sprang into action. EMT Tyler Dunn was on the scene moments later. We walked up and we saw a patient laying in a pool of blood with half of his scalp missing. It was a gruesome scene. Uh, you know, there was a lot of blood. We had a suspicion that there might be a spine injury. The best thing we could do for him was get him to a higher level of care. He was rushed to the hospital. Back at their home, Michael's wife, Dawn, could hear the sirens. You see, hear sirens every day. And then I heard another one, and then I heard another one. And then it escalated to the point that I knew something very serious was going on. And I just instantly knew that it was Michael. And I started trying to text him. And I remember pacing, just pacing up here back and forth, thinking, you know, saying out loud, okay, answer the text, answer the text. Just then, the hospital called, telling Dawn what she already knew. She drove to the hospital and was overwhelmed when she saw Michael's condition. It was terrifying. You know, it was, it was, it was a terrifying moment and I felt so helpless. And there was nothing I could do, absolutely nothing. And in that moment, I thought, hey, Dawn, you know what? One thing you can do is you can pray, and you need to call people that can come and pray with you. Half an hour later, the ER was filled with friends praying for his healing. So when Dan and I arrived to the hospital, we laid hands on Michael to pray for the power of God's healing. It was that simple. He needed desperate healing from Christ. And so the way we know how to do that is to lay hands and pray. That's the power that we have um, as Christians and as believers that God has given us. An MRI showed he had shattered parts of his spinal column and his spinal cord was nearly severed. Pretty much where it's supposed to go, it's cut at least in half. When the doctor came in that last time and looked at me and said, we need, I could tell by the look in his face that he thought that this was gonna have a very grim outcome. Michael needed care beyond what the local hospital could provide. As he was prepped for a life flight to a hospital in Salt Lake City, his wife and friends got in the way. They were finally ready. We felt led that we needed to lay hands on him one more time before they actually rolled him out to the chopper and we held him up. The medical people thought we were insane. They were irritated because we were, you know, blocking their medical care and, and we didn't care. You know, that that's what we were gonna do. We were gonna pray. In Salt Lake City, spinal surgeon Mike Schmidt prepped for a high-risk surgery. It was a very difficult spine fracture he had uh, sustained. This injury is really very dangerous, and we see almost nobody that's not paralyzed uh, that comes in with that kind of injury. The treatment that he has to have might make him actually worse. Don continued to pray. I knew in my soul that this would take a spiritual healing for Michael to be fully restored. Like, I, I definitively definitively knew that. Michael's sister joined Dawn in prayer with a kind of power Dawn had not known since becoming a Christian just a few years earlier. She was inviting the Holy Spirit to come in there and to administer all of the restoration and peace and grace and healing that God promises us every day. She just grabbed a hold of it and brought it into that room for her brother. After several tense hours, Dawn was told the surgery was successful. As Michael began his recovery, Dawn says her faith began to change. It fundamentally changed the way that I walk in my relationship with Jesus. 
I guess it's like the God of the Bible that you read about and that you know is true and that you believe in and that you've surrendered you know, your life to and you rely on for salvation, but came real. He can do all things if you just have faith and you ask and you believe and you surrender. When he awoke, Michael says a relationship with God became a priority like never before. I pressed into him from the minute I knew what had happened to me. The result of it for me is it's brought me so much closer in my relationship with God. I've gotten off the throne of my life and put Jesus Christ on the throne of my life. Over the next several weeks, his physical healing went beyond what many thought possible. I find it remarkable how well he's recovered. It's significant that he's completely healed today uh, simply by the fact that he could have been paralyzed by us trying to fix him. I mean, it truly is a miracle. I don't know how or why he's walking, he's fully functional, has no brain damage, uh, has no loss of motor function whatsoever. In his book, The Hard Road, Michael says God used the accident and his recovery to bring order and peace to his entire life and family. God can make great things out of very difficult times if we press into him, if we lean on him, and if we bring him into our situations. The more I looked at everything surrounding this and everything that happened, the more I saw God's fingerprint all over this. He's present, he's real, he's not changed at all. He's the same as he was. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed, and he is still present in our lives and still loves and cares for us. He's still present with you. Isn't that wonderful? He's right there. He's called Emmanuel, which means God with us, God with you, and he's just a prayer away. How do you get help? The Holy Spirit is called the helper. How do you get help? Well, it's real simple. You ask for it. Just as you would anyone else, you would ask for help. That sometimes requires us to humble ourselves. In Michael's situation, it was an absolute emergency, so there was no thought of humbling. We need you, God, and we need you right now. Years ago, I was doing medical missions in the Philippines, and we had Christian doctors and nurses, and we took them through, how, how do you pray for the sick, and how do you pray for healing? They started seeing so many positive results from that that they decided to turn it around. We used to take patients through an evaluation, then we would pray. They started saying, well, we're having so many good results from the prayer, let's pray first and, and then evaluate. That is the reality of Jesus. He wants to heal. He wants to deliver. He wants to save. All you have to do is ask. We have a magazine, it's called Miracle Living Today. It has stories of people who've seen God answer their prayers. To get your free copy, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. You can visit our website, miraclelivingtoday.com. We want to encourage you in your faith. What God did for others, he will do for you. Well, still ahead, cardiac arrest, followed by a coma. If this woman came out of the coma, doctors told her husband to prepare for the worst. See what happened instead. But first, see the miracle that enabled this groom to rise from his deathbed, make it to the altar. Then I'll be praying for you. Don't go away. Get Miracle Living Today, the devotional magazine from CBN. This beautifully illustrated publication will build your faith with compelling articles shared by CBN hosts and special guest writers. Be inspired by powerful testimonies of people who have seen God answer their prayers in incredible ways. Call 1-800-700-7000. Visit MiracleLivingToday.com or text MIRACLE to 80888 to get your copy. It was so intense with the sinus pressure that it was to the point where my jaws were even hurting from coughing so intensely. It was a battle, it really was. He kept saying to me, this tube will pass. So I just stand up and say, I'm, I'm waiting on you, Lord. I just kept confessing, God is my healer. He is my healer. They were to the section where they were talking about 
um, people receiving healings. They were gonna pray for anyone who was sick. Oh, there's someone you heard the report about sinus conditions and you're saying, please say sinus conditions. So for you, I'm saying sinus condition. All of that inflammation, uh, everything that seems to be swollen and closed up, open now in Jesus' name. I jumped up and my spirit just kind of leaped and I said, that's for me, Lord, that's it. You think maybe he's not mindful of those things, but he's mindful of everything. He's just faithful and he is our healer. I just turned and ex excruciating pain came in my knee on the inside and it was like a jabbing knife. I made it to the doctor, found out it was a torn meniscus. So having the knee injury, being having to slow down was depressing. I was like, Lord, heal this. Sitting on the couch, a 700 club came on and, and that's when I saw uh, Gordon on. We say out loud to it be healed and be made whole. May all pain leave me. In Jesus' name, I receive it now. Now what you couldn't do before, do now. By faith, I'm gonna do this. I'm, by faith, I'm gonna walk. And I was walking, it wasn't hurting. I know that God healed me beyond a shadow of a doubt. Michael was set to get married in just two weeks, and then he was hit with COVID and hospitalized. His condition became so grim, doctors told his fiance that the outlook for his recovery was pretty hopeless. I remember um, praying and just saying, Lord, did we do something wrong? September 11th, 2021 was supposed to be a celebration the day Melanie Fox was to get married. Instead, her 56-year-old fiance, Michael, was in a hospital bed fighting for his life. Their meeting and engagement had been an answer to prayer, one Melanie now doubted. Do you not want us to get married? I was starting to question everything. And I said, Lord, do you not love us anymore? Two weeks before the wedding, Michael contracted COVID. Within days, he was in the hospital with double pneumonia and his oxygen levels had plummeted. According to the doctor's report, his was an extremely unfortunate situation with evidence of continued worsening. The uh, pulmonologist did come in one day and he just kind of stood at the end of the bed and shook his head. And I just looked at him and I said, it's not good, is it? And he said, no, you may want to let his family know that this looks pretty hopeless at this point. Michael's oldest son, Robbie, saw it differently. He was one of many who filled the hospital waiting room praying for his dad. I knew he would walk out of there. I knew at the beginning he would. However, things would only get worse. Over the coming week, Michael would have a stroke and develop sepsis, the leading cause of death in hospitals. Then his kidneys began to shut down. Even after several rounds of antibiotics, nothing was working. And I know that you said, Lord, that we would be together, so I don't understand. And there were times when I honestly was so numb. Then another setback. As medical staff were prepping Michael for dialysis, one of his lungs collapsed. Trying to avoid putting him on a ventilator, they decided first to increase his oxygen and wait to see if that would work. Melanie and Michael's youngest son, John, were waiting in the hallway. And he looked at me and he said, my dad needs a miracle. And I said, yes, he does. And I said, John, why don't you ask God to give him that miracle? And so he just looked up and he said, God, my dad need, really needs a miracle right now. Outside, the hospital parking lot was packed with people also believing for a miracle. God has the final say. Doctors are great. Uh, they've really helped out a lot, and their hands are guided. Um, but they don't always have the final say in things. Within the hour, Michael's oxygen levels had risen and his lungs reinflated, so he didn't need a vent. Not only that, his kidneys began to recover. 
and they said he doesn't need the dialysis. His markers are up, he's good, everything's great, and the, even the sepsis is gone. Soon after, they were able to bring Michael out of sedation. But he wasn't waking up, and doctors cautioned the family about getting their hopes up. The stroke could have long-term serious consequences. And I remember just looking up and saying, Lord, I don't know what's going on, and I don't understand, but I trust you. Finally, Michael woke up. His first words? The same ones he had said to Melanie right after he was admitted to the hospital. I said, you're going to look beautiful in your wedding dress, because I knew, number one, that I was going to see that because the Lord showed it to me, but I also knew that that would bring comfort to her. I thought, OK, Lord, he said I was going to be beautiful in my dress, so I know that he's going to make it through. Michael began to improve and eventually was sent to rehab. He had been in the hospital 43 days when he was discharged. Although it would take months of rehab to overcome the effects of his stroke, there was one thing Michael wasn't waiting for. Oh, I had a lot of challenges because I came home in a wheelchair and I could barely get from the car to the wheelchair. And so uh, that was on October the 12th, I believe. And on October the 17th, I determined I was going to walk down the aisle to marry my wife. And he did. With prayer and rehab, Michael has fully recovered. The happy couple and their families are enjoying every minute they have together, thankful for the miracle God has given them. I had a lot of people praying for me. I'm going to tell you that prayer was, was heard by the Lord. I know. I know it was. Because it not only gave me strength, but it gave Melanie strength. He's always there. He's got us, you know. God's got us. Uh, even in the hardest times. You know, he says he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. So even if it looks like it's just hopeless and it's the end and it's going to be over and done, you know that he's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is always with us. He never turns away from our requests. He never says no. Now, for them, for Michael, it, it, they, it's a natural thing. And they, they started, did we do something wrong? They were looking at, you know, did, did something happen that, that sickness has come as a consequence to what we did? The Bible's really clear on this. Jesus is very clear on it. And, and you find it in John, the ninth chapter. There was a man born blind. And it wasn't the Pharisees. It wasn't the scribes. It wasn't the opponents. It was the disciples that came to Jesus and said, explain this to us. Who sinned? Did his parents sin or did he sin that this horrible thing would happen to him? Because if his parents sinned, how is it just that he suffer with blindness. And if he sinned, how did he do it before he was born? I love the answer Jesus gave. Neither. This happened that the glory of the Lord would be revealed. For Mike, it was, I want to see you in that wedding dress. I know you're going to look great in it. Look to the future. Look to how God's glory is going to be revealed through you. Whatever you're going through, Look to that glory and say, oh, that's what I want. I'm going to proclaim that. I'm going to see that. And if you do that, you'll have it. Well, Dina and her husband were visiting Restoring Hope Church for a second time. And that's when Dina had a sudden heart attack and her husband panicked. Well, the church jumped into action, providing CPR, declaring life, and releasing a powerhouse of prayer. I don't know what's happening. It's like the color in her eyes went out. My brain was bombarding me with, what if she dies? I love my wife very much. What am I gonna do if she's gone? June 2nd, 2021, Felipe and Dina Piazza were attending an evening service at Restoring Hope Church in Hendersonville, Tennessee. This was only their second visit to the church. And while they were enjoying the worship music, 
Dina began to feel ill. Then she collapsed in Felipe's arms. All of a sudden, she just like went sideways and that was it. The color of her skin went out, the color of her lips went out, like everything went out. And I started like going like this on her face and she wasn't reacting at all. I'm scared, I don't know CPR. But members of the church did. Nurses in the crowd rushed to Dina as Pastor Amanda Crabb was informed of the situation. I didn't have time to think. I jump off the stage, got in the microphone, begin to declare to the worshipers, go to the front lines, begin to war in the spirit. Let's pray in faith. No doubt in this moment, we're going to declare the life of Jesus Christ in this room. And so the prayers were praying, the nurses were administering. I was declaring the prophetic word of the Lord. And it was in that moment that you saw the full activation of what the body of Christ is supposed to be. When I saw how they reacted to the situation, that gave me a lot of peace. I don't have to do anything else. Let me call 911. She started declaring life over Dina. The whole church is worshiping, praying, like they never stopped. We were just visiting. They didn't know who we were at all, and they still fought for her life. Emergency medical services arrived within six minutes of Felipe's call. Paramedic Alex Smith attended to Dina. She didn't have a heartbeat and she wasn't breathing. I just remember a lot of people being there and they were praying, but there was that just deep silence. Alex moved Dina's lifeless body to the waiting ambulance outside. At this point, she'd been without a pulse for 10 minutes. After several failed attempts to shock her heart back into rhythm, Alex gave it one more try. Miraculously, this time it worked. He updated Felipe in the congregation before taking her to the hospital. Dina was alive, but now in a coma. She's not moving. If you knew my wife, she's very energetic. So at that moment, she's just laying there. It was pretty rough. I mean, she missed the world to me. It was found that Dina had a blockage in her heart that caused a cardiac arrest. A stent was inserted to open the clogged artery and she was stabilized. But the doctor said that even if Dina came out of her coma, there was still the threat of long-term complications such as brain damage. They told Felipe to prepare for the worst. In the meantime, Pastor Amanda and other members of the church came to visit the Piazzas in the hospital. For three days, they fasted and prayed for Dina's healing. Then, something happened. One of the nurses, she stopped me and she's like, she woke up. And I'm like, what do you mean she woke up? They're like, she woke up. She's totally awake. She's totally conscious. The doctors didn't have a clue what was happening. That, that all the tests that they were running on her were coming back you know, like, good. I mean, this was a miracle. They kept on telling me, you died, you died. And I was like, God, I am so thankful. I was overwhelmed with joy. But at the same time, I felt like, why? You picked me up from the dead? I was dead for so many. I could have been brain dead. A lot of doctors till this day say that they cannot believe what happened. Within a week, she was given a clean bill of health and released from the hospital to reunite with Felipe and their son, Christian. She's had no lingering complications since. Those who witnessed her survival give all the credit to God. Knowing the diagnosis she had was, that is very unique. Seven days later, she walked out of the hospital like nothing was ever wrong. You know, this was a miracle. People prayed, we worshiped, we declared. God was the center point of this whole night. It was the body coming together, functioning according to where we had been commissioned and granted in our level of ability. And by faith, we saw a miracle that day. The Piazzas have since officially joined Restoring Hope Church. They now boldly speak about how God can use the church body to do amazing things, even in the lives of complete strangers. I'm super grateful to God for still having my wife. And it's very emotional because it's like, you see the God of love. I'm super grateful for what he did, but also I'm super grateful for the church for not knowing who we were. And they showed us that love. They took care of us like if we were part of them, like if we were going to that church for forever. I am so thankful, I'm so grateful for Restoring Hope Church. They have become my family. I just have to glorify God that He 
healed me, not only saved my life, but he healed me. It is important that we understand that not the power of prayer, the worship, the faith, the unity of the body together, praying for something, for a miracle, even if you did not know the person, is something that can change anything. Restoring Hope Church, that's a great name. God wants to come to you right now and restore your hope. For Dina, it was hopeless. She was 10 minutes without a pulse, uh, and that was just in the church, and she was still without a pulse in the ambulance. They kept trying to bring her back, and then they finally got that pulse. But it was the prayers, the prayers of the church saying, we want to declare the word of the Lord. We want to prophesy God's word. Now, here's something for you. When you understand that the word of God is a seed and that seed can generate, it can germinate, you can have the, it come to life in you. That's what it means when words are, are prophesied over you. They germinate in your innermost being and they bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. Now, Jesus added to it, you can find it in the Bible, Matthew chapter 13. He's the parable of the sower. And he says, if you can see with your eyes, if you can hear with your ears, and then you have a heart of understanding, he will turn and heal you. Now, Dina didn't have a heartbeat, so how did she have a heart of understanding? It was the people around her that did. And they said, yes, we're going to declare the promises of God. You can be Lazarus. You can be dead four days, and you can still hear the voice of the Lord, that prophetic word, come forth. Now, I'm going to pray for you. We're going to pray prophetically over you, the word of God. Let it get deep in your heart. Let it germinate into life, life forevermore. Lord God, I lift everyone in the audience to you, and I ask that you would stretch forth your hand and heal their diseases. You are the healer. It is your very nature, and you are complete in that. You forgive all their iniquities, and you heal all their diseases. So from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, May they be healed and restored and regenerated now by the power of your word. We receive it now. We rejoice in it now. And we pro proclaim the victory now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you've been touched, let us know. Let us share your good news. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. And we're here for you for prayer. If you need prayer, we're right here. Here's a word from Isaiah. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Stay on Jesus. He's the healer.